Senate finished an overview of chapter <coughs> one. <clears throat> now, I want to remind you that the way we're proceeding here is we're really just sort of <clears throat> investigating these scriptures together the first time through. <clears throat> we'll take at least one other pass through, if not two more. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, because I want to build on certain emphasis, and even though it will require some repeating, it will also develop some expanding. So um, stick with me for this next couple of classes. First Corinthians chapter two. Let's just um, let's just do what we did last class. We only got 16 verses here. Let's just read through chapter two together. Okay. You follow along and I'll read. <clears throat> Thy brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Christ, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the princes of this age that come to naught or nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages unto our glory which none of the princes of this age knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, Yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." All right, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Um, so an identifying mark of Paul's ministry was that he rejected what two things? Yes. Okay, excellence of speech and man's wisdom. Um, uh, you have to remember uh, that the wisdom is still the same wisdom that he's been talking about. He didn't come with a wisdom <coughs> that was going to gain converts to his own lifting up. Now, you have to remember, too, I skipped that in the first chapter, but all the way through here, and we covered this in the last sharing, I think, that I did on um, the tabernacle. We actually went to a bunch of these scriptures, especially chapter 3, but we showed that there is this division going on in the Corinthian church where someone says, I'm of Paul, and someone says, I'm of Apollos, and another one says, I'm of this person and that person and everything. <clears throat> Paul is talking not about any general wisdom. 
He is talking about the wisdom that would promote himself. I didn't come to you in that kind of wisdom. I didn't come to you in a, um, in a uh, motive within me that is going to network everybody, if you understand what I mean. I mean, I'm talking about what most people do today, but it is, and there's nothing wrong with networking, there is something wrong with the wisdom of that being used to promote yourself. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this before, don't anybody get freaked out or whatever by it, but you know, a lot of people on Facebook do it for one purpose. They put their best picture up there. They say, well, what are your interests, you know? And they say all these, you know, these things that they think is going to appeal to somebody. If you're single, you say stuff you think is going to appeal to a guy. You know, it's all this stuff, you know, these are my best traits. We never say, well, I really wanted to murder my brother yesterday. Or, I mean, you know, I mean, regular things that are an actual part of our life. You know what I mean? We would never put all that because we're using a wisdom that promotes ourself to make us look better than what we are. And, and again, stay on Facebook, do whatever you want to do, you know, gold emboss your page. I don't even know what it, how you do any of that. But, I, you know, do whatever. But Paul is dealing with these people over these issues of promoting somebody over someone else or them promoting themselves. And Paul has declared, and here's the thing you have to see, Paul has declared this sort of a theological picture of, uh, of the wisdom of God as opposed to the wisdom of men. The, the, the way Christ proceeds, Christ crucified, the way Christ proceeds, so, so now it's not... That makes it not just a, a contest between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men. It is a declaration of how Christ proceeds. Christ crucified. Okay? So in chapter 2, he's, he's going to talk about how he proceeds. Okay? And he's going to match it right up with Christ crucified. So he starts. Um, and again, he's never really mentioned himself in the first chapter. But in the second chapter, why is he mentioning himself? Only to show that he also has aligned himself with Christ crucified and the wisdom that is of God. And, and in doing so, he is disavowing the wisdom, the ministry built on the wisdom of self-promotion. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. All right. So, see, verse 2. What does Christ and him crucified represent here? Anybody? Yes. Yeah, any way you want to share. To me, it's just that he's, he's, not, he's not doing it. He's, he is going to be that spirit. He's not going to be the preacher and the smart man. He is not going to be something. He is going to be dead. He's going to come in there with that essence. Okay. So I, are you close to a mic where they can get all this? Probably not. So he's not going to be a, a great preacher or... Um, He's going to be a person who is crucified to the Lord. Okay? Anybody else? Yeah. But proceeding by that wisdom, which is, I mean, okay. he's proceeding in this eternal essence, period. Okay. That's sort of the, the area that I wanted to get into. <clears throat> Folks, most of the deeper life preachers who preach Christ and him crucified when they go here, they say, I'm determined not to know anything among you, said Christ and him crucified. They use that as a theological statement, that this is my stand on my theology. This is, this is what I'm going to preach. 
this is what I'm about as a minister uh, and, and as to my belief system. That is not what it's talking about here. Check the context. The whole context is I'm, I, have not, I will not use the wisdom of this world to promote myself. I will not use anything to try to gain you. Uh, I will proceed by Christ and am crucified. I came in fear and in weakness and in trembling. I am a living demonstration of Christ and crucified. He's not trying to convince them of the doctrine or the, the, the message. You understand what I mean? The message. Embrace the message of it. Paul, you know, you know, I can just, I've, I've even taught this before. I haven't for years now in this way, but I have taught it in years and years way back. Paul, you know, was determined not to know anything but Christ and him crucified. So, you know, quit reading, you know, books on, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just coming up, prosperity or something else, you know, give yourself to this message. But that is not what he's talking about here. That's not, he's not proceeding on a theological basis and trying to, to get you to embrace this teaching. He is saying, I'm determined not to proceed in any other way, not to live in any other way, not to establish my ministry on any other foundation than Christ and him crucified. I came not with excellency of speech, I came in weakness. Where have we heard that word before? Chapter 1. Used over and over and over. First for Christ at the cross, God being crucified, the weakness of God. Then what is it God chooses? He's looking for foolish and weak. And now Paul has believed that and embraced that. And as he enters in, as he is ushered in to the presence of these Corinthians now. I mean, the, at the first chapter is not him ushering in, but now the second chapter he is ushered in. And he is ushered in in the very spirit in which he's been saying Jesus did it and that uh, uh, that's the wisdom of God. And I believe this to such a degree that it affects my way of proceeding. Is that... Is that clear? Yes. Also, by, by presenting his own life as an example, he's, he's, I mean, it's what you just said, that he's not presenting to them doctrine or teaching, but he's presenting his own life as an example, which, which, which means they're not exempt from it. Right. It brings it into the life, of, uh, into the realm of practical, this is the way we live. This is not just the way he is. Right. That's, that's good, and I'm not trying to cut you off. I just want to make sure it gets on there. She was just saying that if Paul lives this way, he's saying also this is the way we live, and so you're not exempt from that. We, this is the family of God. This is the wisdom of God. This is the way of God. This is, um, and, and, if it, and if it is, then anyone with any sense at all that loves Jesus and wants to follow Jesus will follow him in his way. Now, you know, we don't get that when he says, take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. We kind of go, well, he doesn't really mean that. He means get, you know, rich and prosperous and drive a big car and be famous and have all this stuff. That's really what he means, you know. And did you have your hand up? Yeah, and just with Jennifer, mm -hmm. she said the same thing that just this culture is so familiar that he's coming to like today with everything that people are listening for is a, a deep message or something to do. Like if they hear foolishness, they're going to be foolish and they're going to do weakness. And he's saying, I'm not coming in an Old Testament paper. I am, the spirit of it is written in me. We are, right. we are new, we are new recreations of the spirit of this. We're not teaching something or doing something right now. We are the being of this. And it's, you know, it's such a job. In a, a certain job. sense, you could say that we are the incarnation of it. Now, I know that's a weird way of putting it, but in a certain way, you could say that because, folks, Jesus was the incarnation of it. It's exactly what it was. I still see a lot of hands. I want to make sure that I get people who haven't called me.
Right. He's determined to see this through in the in them. Right. You know. Yeah. It's not just knowing I'm gonna know Christ crucified. And it's we'll see this thing. later on because yeah. he he goes out of his way not to promote himself. Because remember, he's one of the ones mentioned there, Apollos and, and Peter and 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 Paul, I am of this one. He goes out of his way, even though he's using himself as an example later on, he will go out of his way to not promote himself. In fact, to make himself look foolish and weak. <laughs> and he does. He does. Because, why? Because he believes this. He has, you know, that's what I saw in Galatians 2.20. I mean, God just bowled me over, you know, because, you know we, know, we know the first part. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me by giving himself for me. Basically, that's the translation of that, and that's what he saw. He said, I saw how Jesus was, and he loved by giving himself, and I'm going to love him by giving myself, so that, so that when you, you start, I am crucified with Christ, and who loved me and gave himself for me, it swings right back around to I am crucified with Christ because I'm going to love by giving myself. But it comes back to him again that the, he's the source within us. Christ, Christ crucified is the life. And I can't help but end up there, you know. And uh, so anyway, that, let's say that. Carolyn? Right. And, and so many times we go after the message because it, I mean, it resonates with us right. in our spirit, but not realizing that we're actually going after our teaching or our message, and that's why we would fall and fail um, because we're not going after the person. And as Paul, you know, he's determined not to know anything. It's not, I'm going after Christ and the crucified, I'm not going after anything else but Him. It does. And, and like I said, his nature comes through because it's his nature, not mine. That's right. And to me, that's basically. So she's, Carolyn's saying that we're, you know, she sees Paul going after not the message, but the person, going after Christ and him crucified in his spirit. And in his, I mean, in that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's, I want to embrace the essence of God. And if I, and she said, if you have that, if you have Christ, then you have the other things. If you have the essence within you, the core of the essence of God, the fruit comes out from that. That's automatic. That's not something you have to work on. Most Christians are working on the fruit without the core essence, which is Christ crucified. And so they, they wonder how, you know, all this stuff doesn't happen. And, you know, and they wonder what's, you know, anyway, I don't want to go into that too much. It, it, did I see another hand? Anybody else? Um, okay, verse uh, 3, and we, we've mentioned it, but I'll just read it. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Um, and I already mentioned this, but uh, in the first chapter, Jesus, what God chooses, and Paul all have embraced the foolishness of God as their way. And that's what he's doing here. I was with you in weakness. I he could, he could have well said, I embrace the foolishness of God as my wisdom. He could have also just as easily said, I embrace the wisdom of God, which is foolishness. <laughs> you say, I'm, I'm just switching them there. Uh, I embrace the weakness of God because Jesus, come on. You know, whatever weakness Paul is coming to them in is nothing like being beaten and slapped and mocked and, you know, stone, you know, all the stuff, so the spear shoved in your side, all the stuff they did to Jesus. That was God. That was God they did that to. 
And at any moment, and just a reminder to let us know that, he said, I could have called 10,000 angels, you know. I always think of in the Old Testament when one angel showed up, and I think it was the, the Chaldeans, the, the Babylon, it could have been the Assyria. One angel showed up and killed like, you know, 100,000 people, you know. I thought, 10,000, what would that do, you know? I could have called that, and I didn't. And I won't. And we'll, those are the kind of things we'll get into on our second bypass through this. Um, <clears throat> verses 4 and 5. And my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Um, there you go. Verse 4 and 5 both really talk about that, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. All right. The wisdom of men, the power of God. All right. Has he left his subject, people? He has not left it. Have we left the subject many times how we read that? Yes, we, we have. And, you know, best thing to do is just admit that and say, Lord, open my eyes, you know. Uh, so many people see that as the power of God being, you know, well, come to the altar and I'll lay hands on you and you'll fall over. You know, well, will I be changed? No, but it'll be neat. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. It's me up here. So I have to be my typical Randy way. But, I mean, you know, it'll be neat and I'll feel good. And, and you can lay there. Some will even lay there and say, I can't move. This is incredible. You know, is that it? Really? The, you know, and I like feeling the presence of God on me, but I'd rather have the presence of God in me, and the presence of God in me is Christ crucified, folks. Okay, so I don't have any problems. I have laid hands on people in New Creation Fellowship, and they've actually gone down. I told them, get up. No, not really. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. You know, God can do anything he wants to. <clears throat> but I, I don't want to read into 1 Corinthians 2 what is not there. I don't want to read the cross out of it because he has already told us what the power of God is. He has already told us that it is Christ and him crucified. And so, he, and remember, this was a letter. There was no chapter 1 and chapter 2. This is just a continuing letter. You know, it would be like if you're writing, you know, and then somebody starts, you know, just at a certain juncture decides to start getting something else out of it that you haven't been talking about. You know, you're talking about going to the zoo and they think you're talking about committing suicide or something. You're going, I did, you know, I did, that is not what I said there, you know. <clears throat> and all right. So. Um, that your faith should not stand, and this is verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. All right, so the, he is, let me see if I can word this right. He is sort of refuting the connection of faith with self-promotion. Uh, I remember one time talking, uh, I used to be involved with the ministers of this town, and we used to spend a lot of time together, and one of them said, well, you know, Randy, you, your church would be a lot bigger if you'd learned to market yourself. And I said, well, that's never going to happen. Who was it? Lindsay was telling. Yeah, you were telling me this story, or maybe you said it from up here when you, she said something about, you know, well, they don't advertise. They're not, you can't find them anywhere. And, you know, and yet people still come. And amazingly from all over the world. I mean, you know, and how does that happen? Well, we are blessed because if we promoted ourselves, there would be a horrible, large influx of people who don't belong here. Oh, wait a minute. Well, what does that mean? Folks, that would be so ugly, I can't even tell you. 
I mean, because they don't fit. They don't, they're not supposed to be here of God. They're, you know, imagine somebody who is called to be here, but they don't, uh, you know, I mean, not called to be here, but they're here, and they're trying to fit in with something that is just not there, never will be, at, at least in that sense, you know. I've told people, don't, you know, if God didn't call you here, don't come here. Go find that place where you feel at home, where you feel the fed, where you, you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, that's, go find that place. Go find that shepherd, that pastor that feeds you and that, that you feel covered by, you know, go, go, you know, but don't waste your time. Don't waste years, <laughs> you know. So <clears throat> anyway, um, I guess my point was, he is connecting faith with the wisdom of men. Well, what does that mean? That means that he is saying, don't connect. I won't. Don't you connect. The concept of faith with things that are actually just secretly self-promotion. Okay? But rather, he would rather your faith stand in what? Well, what is the, yeah, there it is, there it is. He'd rather your faith stand in Christ crucified. That's the power of God. That's what he's already determined. Now, before I call on you, is anybody already beginning to see a pattern of Corinthians where everything is linked together and it's really this beautiful tapestry and he never leaves any, any of this original stuff. He's actually building as he goes. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it is that this whole thing is going to get to a place where once he gets past talking about what Jesus did and what he's done and everything, he's going to start laying a template of Christ crucified over their, their way. And he's going to be showing them where you're out of whack. Uh, Jennifer? Right. You know, whatever. But um, but faith in planting a seed, you know, it, it's like when you see when something goes into death, it requires faith. It's like if, if something disappears, or if something is unseen, or if something, you know, in order to have the life and the resurrection, that there has to be the death. And it's like you've got to have faith in in that. Yeah. But but when you're, you know, I'm planting a seed. I have faith that in the spring something green is going to come up. But I, I could also plan to go to the store in the spring. But and I could say I have faith that the stores are going to have grown plants that I can put in the ground. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, but it's not that doesn't no, really sorry. require faith no. in that because I know it's it going to be there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Which is maybe a faith issue, but. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. Um, all right, let's look at verse 6 through the end of the chapter here. I want to uh, remind you of some things. We'll deal with this in a little more detail uh, with our next pass. But um, he talks about we speak of wisdom, but not the wisdom of this age. Then verse 7 uh, uh, it's a hidden wisdom, verse 8, that none of the princes knew this or they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9, I have not seen or ear heard. It has to be revealed all the way down. Um, uh, but the, Verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. Uh, verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things yet himself. For, and verse 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? yet that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> All of that, 
Now, this is our first pass, really. All of that is uh, the common theme that he's been talking about. As I said, right now we're not going to do it on your own. If you will take the time, you will notice, like I said, starting verse 6, he's still talking about this thing of the wisdom of the world. Um, then he's talking about the princes of this world not knowing Therefore, because they don't understand God's wisdom, they crucified Jesus by wicked hands, as it says in the book of Acts. Uh, verse 9 is really not really hardly at all like what we think it really is, but, it is, but I have not seen, ear hath not heard. We sort of look at that, maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but we sort of look at that like, I have not seen, I have not heard what has entered into the heart of man, that God, but God hath revealed. So we sort of look at, uh, I, I haven't seen this, but God's revealing it. God's going to reveal it to me by his spirit. But really what he's saying is, for the person of this world's wisdom, they've never glimpsed the wisdom of God. They don't have a clue. And then he's going to get into how we do. And I know that it talks about revelation, and I know that we think it's all just based on revelation, but it's a particular revelation that's going to make the difference, okay? And then, um, and then verse 14, but the natural man receiveth. See, do you see how every ounce of this has continued this theme of either the wisdom of this world or the wisdom of, of Christ crucified? That's, that's the theme all the way through. Um, let's see. God, well, God's wisdom of weakness through the cross compared to the wisdom of this world. God's wisdom of weakness. And that's, that's as I said, we'll get into that more. So let's go ahead and go into the third chapter now. Um, and we'll only read down to... Um, <clears throat> verse 11. So let's start at chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with solid food, for to this time ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted Apollos' water, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. But we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's cultivated field. You are God's building According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth on it. But let every man take heed how he buildeth upon it. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> All right. So verses 1 through 3 here uh, is talking about, uh, I can't speak unto you as unto spiritual, but carnal, I fed you with milk. Um, for you are carnal, whereas there is among you envying and strife. My question for you is, does the third chapter continue the same thought as what Paul started in the first chapter? Yes or no? I saw for sure, okay, two people. Okay, yes. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't change anything here. He's, he came out of it talking about uh, verse 14, but the end of chapter two, the natural man receiveth not the things, but he that is spiritual, and our brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. You see that? I mean, it's, he's literally using the same words. There is no chapter break because this was a letter. It's just the next sentence. <laughs> okay? And he's still speaking of how you perceive things. You see things in a carnal fashion, and there is a spiritual way of proceeding and of seeing things. Uh, I wrote in here, uh, my question was, does the third chapter continue the same thought as what Paul started in the first chapter? And I put yes, but now, because he, he did make a change here, but now he is lumping the Corinthians in with those having the wisdom of this world. He hadn't done that to this point. 
to this point, he's only talked about concepts. Those people, you know, those people who perceive by the wisdom of this world. Uh, and Christ and the ones that he chooses, because that's what he chooses, he always chooses, the weak and the foolish. And, and me, we follow the wisdom of the cross. But now, he says, okay, now, now that we've had a good little lesson here on the differences between these two kind of wisdoms, you, Corinthians, you have the wisdom of this world. You are carnal and proceeding, and you're like a baby. You're like a baby. Um, verse 4, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? And I wrote, this verse is a bridge connecting two thoughts. You see the, you see the bridge of, chapter, of uh, verse 4? What does a bridge do? You have to start on one side usually and work to the other side. Anybody tell me what the two thoughts are? Yes. The, the common viewpoint <coughs> of the world and the other side is God's ministers who are actually ministering in the proper reality of Christ and crucified. Are those the two different things? Well, let's see. The word carnal is tied to the ongoing dividing of the two kinds of wisdom. Right? You agree with that? Well, you should, because that's what it's done. <laughs> you know, not because I said it, but because that's it, the way it's written in the Bible. <laughs> the word carnal is tied to the ongoing dividing of the two kinds of wisdom, and it is being linked to their divisions and the wisdom that has caused them to choose certain ministers over others. Yes? Something a little louder. I'm just, I don't know if this is right. I shouldn't probably have raised my hand, but just that they're thinking, oh, I've, I've got it. I've got the, the wisdom of it. It, it. What Paul says, it all makes sense, and their attitudes on the inside of their heart are all division, and I'm with him, and you know, strife and envy. And he's like, what I'm talking about is those attitudes. I mean, I'm not talking about a wisdom like the Greeks, I'm talking about a wisdom of a nature in you that wouldn't do that. So he's trying to say, look, here's a practical example of the way y'all with these guys are, you know. You're all divided over that, but that's not the wisdom that I'm speaking of. That's exactly <clears throat> And that's, that's what I'm saying, is that he has now taken the sort of ethereal teaching of the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man, and he's applied it practically in their situation. He said, now, let's talk about this, okay? Folks, would to God that the Holy Spirit had freedom in our life to, you know, to, to take doctrinal things that we believe and go, now, here's where you're totally going against that. You know, and the, and the way that he does that, and I believe the only way to really change, other than, you know, change your theology in your mind, oh, now I... No, I'm a Christ crucified person, you know, even though you don't live it, you know, it's like, I know all the scriptures, you know, is, is that, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, well, it's kind of like those overheads over there, except for if you had a sort of a, like, here's, here's your life, like this overhead, and that, that represents your life, that rectangle, and, and in it, there is, let's say that, the pattern of your life within you is sort of like this. Okay. The line that I made in there is like a, sort of like a serpent. Okay. Now, let's see. Jennifer, could you hand me just any old overhead over there? Hope it's a good one or I'm going to send you back. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Now just imagine if 
this on here was the template of Christ crucified. And we comprehended Christ crucified in a very real way that we, we could check ourselves when at a certain time we, we were proceeding a certain way and the Holy Spirit could just sort of lay that template over it and we'd go, oh my God, I'm out of whack. You, you understand what I'm saying? And we go, it doesn't fit. And you want to, of course, we're trying to make it fit onto our life, our path, you know. Oh, you know, well, if we could just bend Jesus a little better, you know, he'll, you know, but, but see, we're supposed to conform to him, not him to us. And, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, this example I'm using is sort of an understanding of the way that I proceed in my life because I, that's, how, that's the only way I can check myself. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the only way I can check myself. And so I go, oh, my God. <laughs> it does. It happens regularly. Go, Whoa. Okay. I thought I was doing pretty good there. But, but if you, you know, but if you only have the teaching in your head, then the template is you don't have the template. You only have a teaching of the cross stuff, the deep stuff, the mysteries that I'm are you sort of getting the idea of what, you know, the deeper life people, the, the people, it's not about changing and being conformed to the image of Christ. It's just about knowing deep stuff so everybody would think we're really cool or something, you know, except God. He's the only one, you know. And so, but, but if the heart, as Carolyn was talking in the last class, begins to just pursue the Lord, begins to pursue, and let me be specific, Christ and him crucified. As Paul said, I'm determined. Look, I'm determined. Okay? So you are no longer just pursuing the theology. You are trying to get the Holy Spirit to build a template for you of what he's like. And the cool thing is, if you're wondering or you know about this, the cool thing is we're going to get into the template. Paul's going to use it. He's going to use it on the Corinthians later. He's really not doing it yet. He's going to do it major. I mean, he's going to do this, and then he's going to go, okay, see this right here? Okay, now look at this. You know, he'll point to their template of their life, and then he'll go, now, check this. And he'll go, okay, see this right here? Look, look what the, the opposite wisdom of God brings about there. Does that sound good? You're going to miss it, so (laughs) bye-bye. Thank God for the Internet, huh? Um, Okay. We're we're getting close here. Okay, let's uh, look at verses 18. There's some really good things that I want to cover in the other verses, but we're not going to do it right now. So let's look at 18 through 20. Uh, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Okay. so I wrote down contrast and compare these verses with chapter 1, verses 19, 20, and 23. So I'm going to read chapter 1, verse 19, 20, and 23. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Um, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And then verse 23 but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews, a stumbling block, and under the Gentiles, foolishness. All right. So, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Let him become a fool. What does that mean? Pardon? Anybody else? Kelly? Kelly? I don't know, just let him quit it. Quit being smart and all that jazz and just start conforming to the lamb and get real with your motives and with the real deal on the inside. <laughs> That's what it means to me. Yeah. Well, what he's really saying, what he's really saying is let him become a fool like Jesus. 
like Paul, I am weak, and I let him be categorized among those who are of Christ crucified. Let the, I, I wrote down, let them embrace the weakness of Christ crucified, the wisdom of God. Let them become a fool. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Um, at the cross, Jesus took the wise in their own craftiness, right? Because he says, uh, verse 19, in it, for the wisdom of this world is with foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Um, because uh, ver, uh, still uh, in chapter 2, verse 8, which none of the princes of this age knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They could not help themselves. Their way of dealing with the problem is kill the person. Is get, well, get rid of the person. We, we may not, you know, kill them, but we'll try to get them fired or something. You know, you know what I'm saying. Or, to, or look bad to other people. Well, you, you see what so-and-so did, you know. It's the same spirit. And it's the same thing. Uh, that you, you cannot stop. You, there just must be a transformation. You cannot stop. You will do that, and that's your wisdom. And God taketh the wise in their own craftiness. They're planning and conniving and manipulating and doing everything to make things fall their way. And Jesus is just dying and letting them slap him and beat him and everything else. But, you know, life comes out of that kind of death. Life comes out of that kind of death. God knows it, and Paul knew it, and we're supposed to know it. So we say, well, poor Jesus, he's hanging up there. No, poor them. I mean, Jesus is carrying the cross, and the women are weeping. He said, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. I'm okay. I'm going to come up off of this, baby. You know what I mean? I give myself totally. Don't weep for me. This is, this is who I am. Weep for yourselves. Because... No matter how hard we try to avoid it, if we have not had the wisdom of God, the weakness of God worked into us as Christ crucified, we will always go back to craftiness. Craftiness. Um, and then verse 20. Uh, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Oh. Man, what a great verse. What a great verse. What does it mean? The, 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 quest, the right question isn't, is it true? The right question is, what does it mean? Then when you find out what it really means, now you can see if it's true or you want to agree with it as truth. What does it mean? What does it mean? And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, meaning these people who go by the wisdom of this world. And folks, they're not stupid. They're wise. They are going to get ahead. They're going to get their way. They're going to get what they want. You know, and they're smarter than all these dumb people around them because they're able to manipulate them and get their way. But this says, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. What does it mean? Means what? Empty. Okay. Meanness. Yes, Kelly? He, just that he knows that they're going to amount to absolutely nothing in that day when the power is released from the cross, and you know, in that day. Kim? Well, I was going to make a comment kind of that it would like to prevent growth, kind of, mm -hmm. because then in a real mm -hmm. personal way, if you think you got it, and it is man's wisdom, yeah. most likely you're not going to be open to the spirit. Right. And Jesus said, if the light which is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? Because the, we think it's light. We think we know something, and we're really ignorant, just like what you're, we're talking about here. And Paul is addressing how great is that darkness. So you're, you're right. Yes. It's not going to It's not going to satisfy them. Okay. Um, I was 
Amen. Amen. Um, here's what I wrote. Thoughts of the wise are vain. Their wisdom is founded on vanity, pride, bigger, better, wiser, more than what others have. Just pride, vanity. It's all, it's all based on their vanity to look better, to, to be, you know, that's, you know, more, more competitive so that I win, you know. So all of that is, the Lord knoweth the thoughts, they are all coming out of vanity. They're all coming out of pride and self and, tr and every act is trying to make themselves look better to everyone else. And Jesus came, I mean, God, you know, we'll just end with this. Here's Jesus is God. And so then he comes down as a man, He's but not as a man. He's born in a manger, you know. And it occurred to me the other day, you know, Christmas, you know, we see these little, these little nativity scenes. They're so sweet, aren't they? Little nativity scenes. Folks, the census was being taken. The inn was full. You don't think the barn was full? You know, we see one little, a little sheep and a little, you know. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, they traveled with, on camels a lot and donkeys. Okay. And if you can imagine that barn full of, but we, we see a light coming down and they're right in the middle and there's just like a few animals and they're all going, oh, it's got to be something special. You know, <laughs> you know, I don't think they noticed. Nobody else noticed, you know, not by looking. I mean, even the three wise men probably would have passed right on by if a light hadn't just stopped. You know, God says, okay, here it is. Yeah. Stop signal. Yeah. The light, you know. Um, but, but here he is. He's God. Then he comes down. He's a little infant. Then he's raised as a, you know, this is the son of God. Then he's raised as this kid. And then he becomes as a man. And as a man, it says that he took on the form of a servant. He didn't take on the form of a king. He didn't take on the form of a, of, a, of a labor leader or of a this or that or whatever. He took on the form of a servant, washing his own disciples' feet, doing that kind of stuff. And then he humbled himself and became obedient even to death, but not just any death, the most heinous criminal death that you could imagine, which is just the opposite of what Vanity would cause you to do. Vanity would have you work the other way. Well, I'm at the bottom, but I work my way up. He was at the top, and he worked his way down. <laughs> All right, let's, let's end this thing. Anybody getting anything out of this? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the introduction that you've given us. We pray that you will um, solidify now. Lord, first of all, solidify in our being the clear-cut direction that Paul is taking from chapter 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6, all the way through. Make us sensitive and sharp to notice identifying words that are used over and over, power, wisdom, wise. Help us to see the spirit behind the words and not just read the words in the context of what we've been taught or what we've assumed. We want to hear your heart. You're the author. Only you truly know. And prepare us, Father, to be able to see and embrace the process of laying the template of Christ crucified over our lives, even as Paul will do that with the Corinthians' life. Help us to see that, and to see that pattern, and to see how clearly it was to the apostle, and 
how that clarity made him fit for being able to come and help those who did not yet see it. Father, keep us broken, humble, and needy, and weak so that Christ may become everything to us. So that when it comes time to glory, we will not take that unto ourselves. We will quickly say, Jesus did that. Jesus is that. Father, thank you for this night. We ask you to also bless all the proceedings uh, tomorrow and the next day and the next day and even Monday, Father. Um, as some of us will end up driving down to Longview to put him in his final resting place, Papa in his final resting place beside his wife there. We ask you to minister and be known in your people at the funeral and at the wake and, and at whatever times that we gather because your son is the life of this vessel. We are your body, Jesus. And so may it be beautiful, bright, shiny testimony to those who don't know you and to those who are yet knowing you. Moved by the Holy Spirit, we ask, we ask that you be glorified, Jesus. That's our heart for you. It's in your name we ask. Amen. We're dismissed.